she's the bitch queen from hell, a modern-day femme fatale, a soap super bitch for the 21st century, she is Tracy Barlow. The truth is, Harold, your loving husband couldn't wait to get his hands on a real woman. <sighs> you are evil! Because she is the minxiest minx, she really is. She is crazy. Who could have guessed that the whinging teenager, known simply in Soapland as, oh, Tracy, could return with such devastating effect? But return she did to wreak havoc and leave a trail of destruction across Weatherfield. She doesn't care who she tramples on, she doesn't care whose life she ruins. As long as she's all right, that's all that matters. I think Tracy Barlow is the all-time soap. Bitch. 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 The new remodeled Tracy is a beautiful man-eating monster who comes back with a bang or three. Not content with bedding her mother's former lover, she then slept with her grandmother's boyfriend. Next, she got resident oddball Roy Cropper into bed for a one-penny bet. When she discovered she was pregnant, she sold the baby to Roy and Haley. Congratulations. You're going to be a daddy. Only to reveal later that Roy's not the father at all. Come again. It's your baby. Even when the baby's born, Roy still hasn't got a clue that he's the innocent victim of terrible Tracy, the nastiest girl in soap. He's a dangerous girl. If you're on the wrong side of her, you want to watch out. She is rotten to the core, but I love her. It, it all came about at one conference when one particular writer, Darren Little, said, let's bring Tracy back. Simple as that. Oh, what a surprise! Me. The main reason why I wanted to bring her back um, uh, was, one, I felt the street needed a bitch, um, and I felt that Tracy could do it. Beverly, darling, you were looking at the female equivalent of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. I always get my mum. We didn't intend that Tracy would come back and be quite such a super bitch, and I think that's credit to Kate Ford that she's done that so wonderfully well, and then the writers have gone with it. So where did this monster come from? And what made her like this? Let's rewind here. Kate Ford is actually the fourth person to play Tracy. First, there was Tracy Langton, the only child of Ray and Deirdre, played for eight years by Christabel Finch. Next, there was Tracy Mark II, played for three years by Holly Charmerette. Then came Tracy Mark III, brought memorably to life by Dawn Acton. Well, how do you think I feel coming from a broken arm? I don't think that's very clever. Tracy? Tracy's quite unique in the history of Coronation Street because she was born in the programme and is still in the programme. So you've seen her from, the well, from conception through to what she is now. I remember her being born, and I remember that Deirdre wanted to call her Leonora, and Ray sneaked off and registered her birth and called her Tracy instead, and Deirdre was furious. That's one of the first things I remember at Coronation Street, actually. I do you remember Tracy's first arrival in the street? Um, I actually think the, the priest had a little premonition of uh, what was coming up because he refused to baptise the girl. And quite right, she's the devil incarnate, that woman. She was actually known as Baby for the first few episodes until finally they got the Reverend agreed to do it. It wasn't long before Tracy was worrying the life out of her mother. I remember Deirdre going for a stroll with Tracy in a pram and leaving her outside the Rovers. And then she went inside. Tracy! But fortuitously, Tracy! Uh, a lady, a childless lady, who'd gone a bit bonkers, had gone and sort of taken Tracy for a little walk around the block, so she was saved. Not so fortuitous now, of course, for Brian Haley, but, but certainly for Deirdre at the time. Tracy's dad, Ray Langton, left for a new life in Holland when she was just one. Mum Deirdre married Ken Barlow when Tracy was four. Five years later, she was legally adopted by a new dad and formally became Tracy Barlow. New name, new child actor. Every so often, Tracy would disappear for six months to a year and we'd be shouting upstairs, are you getting out of the bath, Tracy, or whatever? And then a new Tracy would come downstairs. Uh, my memories of the young Tracy Barlow are, are somewhat vague because she was so rarely seen. She was always upstairs uh, playing a bross tape. She was always sent out of the way of trouble, which with hindsight was probably a good thing. 
My abiding memory of the young Tracy Barlow is that she kept going upstairs to play her tapes. The now famous Tracy's tapes. Oh no, you don't like Jason Donovan, do you? I bet you are into Bross as well, aren't you? They're all right. Look a bit like you. No, they don't. They don't look anything like me. Yeah, they do. All soft. Anyone that's locked in the bedroom for about 12 years listening to one tape, I'm sure it's about to turn a little bit crazy. You to go upstairs, put some tapes on. Out stuff's in my room. Maybe it was one of those kind of like, you know, those odd rock tapes. If you play it backwards, it like satanic verses come out and things. Dodgy tapes or no dodgy tapes, Tracy was soon on fast forward to becoming a teenage rebel. In Dawn Acton, uh, we saw the glimmers of the future monstrous Tracy to come. Where have you been till this time? Ow. Where? I told you, ow. I'm going to bed. No, you are not. You're going to sit down and tell me what you've been up to. No, I'm not. It's none of your business. Don't you dare talk to me like that. I loved the character of Tracy when she was a teenager because that's when you first got a taste of who she might be later. I suppose you said you were at a Tupperware party. Or did you tell him that you're in bed with Mike Baldwin? That is enough. Did my dad wait up for you? Be quiet. I bet he did. Go to bed now. And I bet you told him a pack of bloody you lies. You heard me. I mean, I didn't think we really saw a completely wicked streak then, but she was a very, very stroppy teenager. I hate you, you rotten cowie tart. Uh, but she was also, I mean, she was a difficult kid. And frankly, who can blame her growing up with Ken and Deirdre? But she did, she did cause havoc and obviously got into lots of scrapes. A bit more than the rebellions of, a, of an adolescent, I think it was a, there was a sign that Tracy was going to be pretty difficult. But nothing like as difficult as actually happened. Nobody could have been prepared for the sort of like new incarnation of, of Tracy, the way she's turned out now. Coming up, she's back and she's straight in the sack. Tracy's marriage was over and she wanted a man, or three. She didn't care who they were. Look at her. No shame, no remorse, you brazen little horsey. So, Tracy Barlow's back, cutting a swathe through the manhood of Weatherfield. We ask why the teenage rebel became a full-on super bitch. And is this the moment when the child became a monster? But I'm here, I'm with it's you. It's not you I want, it's Deirdre! ta -da! Oh! But first, how the monster was brought back to life on the scriptwriter's table. I pitched this story and, and all the story was, was it's Christmas Day in the Barlows. Um, everyone's sitting down, this door opens and Deirdre's going, who's that? And I said, and this stunning brunette walks in and Deirdre says, and before I could say anything, about three writers around the table went, oh, Tracy, love, because they knew where I was going with it. But that was enough and, uh, you know, that was in. Everyone was like, yeah, come on, let's bring her back. It's a difficult thing when you bring a character back from the past. Sometimes it can work brilliantly and sometimes it can be a disappointment. But what I felt was that if you brought Tracy back, you immediately had three generations of Barlow women, because obviously the Deirdre Blanche thing is wonderful. And then if you bring Tracy back, you've got these fantastic three generations of women, very strong women in their different ways. And poor old Ken stuck in the middle of it all like a war zone. Um, and immediately you're going to get some kind of fireworks. We didn't know how many and how big the fireworks were going to be, but we knew we were going to get something good. Obviously the last time we seen her she'd been played by Dawn Acton and Dawn had played her since the age of eight and Dawn had sort of put her stamp on Tracy and done some really good work but because we knew we wanted big stuff from the new Tracy um, you wanted to make sure that you had a trained actress so when we auditioned for the part of Tracy we had Dawn come in as well um, and Dawn, Dawn did it as well and she was fine um, but Kate was better. Kate Ford wasn't so sure. Her mind was elsewhere at a theatre production in South Wales. I was having to be on stage in Cardiff at 7 o'clock and I had the audition for this. So it was a bit of a hectic day getting down here and I actually did the worst read in the world for, this, for the audition because all I was thinking was that I had to be back on stage for 7 o'clock. And I just, it came out like, sort of like... But miraculously, I, I got a recall. I don't know how. <laughs> and then the producer came and chatted to Anna myself and said, the new Trace is coming back. And um, he said he didn't think it would be Dawn Acton. It was upsetting that it wasn't Dawn, because I love Dawn. And she was... We got on so well, and we had a lot of laughs, and 
Um, that was that was a bit of a shame. We did feel that this was an opportunity potentially to slightly reinvent the character and take her in a new direction. Uh, so I, I spoke to Dawn and we, we did meet her for the part and, and, and we did the camera test, but at the same time we met several other actresses. Um, when we saw Kate, she just felt absolutely perfect. There was something uh, believable about the way she looked that you could actually accept her physically as Tracy Barlow very quickly. But she had just a wonderful quality and edge, which uh, I couldn't really put my finger on at the time, but I knew it was something special. That's all right, good news. It was a really bizarre thing. I was just at the bus stop and it was raining, and I remember I just found out I'd got the job. I was like, God, I'm Ken Barlow's daughter. That's really weird. <laughs> it's really surreal. The thing is about <laughs> soap is that if you started on a drama, you'd all be starting together. Whereas on soap, you're starting with people that have been there for 20 years, 25 years. But the other actors know that. I mean, when there's n even now when there's new people starting, I, I, you know, you can see that you know it takes a while for people to just relax, you know, because. But people know that, and people are really very supportive over that. So, and, and Annie and Bill have just been great. And I remember saying at the end of one scene she was in, I said, you know, welcome to being Tracy. You, you, you're part of the family now. And she said, oh, great, thanks for saying that. She's lovely. She's smashing. And she's the grown-up Tracy, and I think she's doing a fantastic job. One of the first things Kate had to do was to decide how to develop the character. There's more to acting than just reading the lines. When you, when you got to the audition, there was a character description which gave, like, a brief background, and it said something like, you know, Tracy's always been a bit of trouble and nothing's changed or something like that. But it didn't say anything else. It just said that she's back from London and she's not going to be walked all over. But that was it, and the rest, it, I think people, they just wanted you the actress that they chose to put her own kind of stamp on it. I remember talking to Kate about this. I said, you, you can put your own interpretation into it, and the writers will pick up and take that forward. So Kate played a quite hard and tough, uh, which was good, g coming back in the way she was. And of course the writers picked up on that and made her even harder and tougher. And she went down this road of becoming the total monster. Monster? You're a monster. Yeah, well the monster is going for a lie down. But there was an even more monstrous idea that never made it to the screen. Initially I wanted her to have an affair with Peter. There's no blood there, but Peter would be Ken's son and Deirdre, uh, Tracy's Deirdre's daughter. And the idea of them two getting together and what Ken and Emily would say about it, um, I then wanted Tracy to be pregnant um, and marry Peter and uh, somehow or other sort of live next door, live, move into Emily's or something. So you had Ken and Deirdre in one house and Peter and Tracy in another and this, this sort of shared grandchild and all the sort of the emotional turmoil. But that never happened. What did happen was a sexy storyline with shattering consequences for the Barlows. This is this character who's only been on the street for, for one day and she shagged someone. Now, to me, that's putting the stamp on her. I think when the new Tracy came back, you're going, look, how much is she going to be like Deirdre? And I think it was on her first day, she ended up between the sheets with Deb. You went, all right, chip off the old block then. Are you telling me that you spent the night with a man you've only just met? No, I've known him an hour or so. Are you shocked? Yes, I am. It's no big deal. Everyone does it. Well, I don't. Yeah, well, I oh, don't. yes, you do, Deirdre, remember? We'd set up a situation the previous Christmas where Dev and Deirdre had slept together, and we had to pay it off at some point, and we were just waiting for the perfect moment. They didn't know. I know that they didn't really know what they were going to do with Tracy. They just knew that she was going to come in and have an affair with Dev a year to the day that her mum had slept with Dev, Deirdre had slept with Dev. Tracy always seems to run off with uh, Deirdre's boyfriends. They do seem to have the same taste in men. She really enjoyed it. She enjoyed seeing Deirdre squirm. Tracy inevitably found out about her mum and Dev, and being Tracy, inevitably had to spill the beans to Ken. It just happened, and I wish to God it hadn't. And until Madam opened her mouth here, it was dead and buried. That was a horrible thing to do, because she knew that that would cause possibly irretrievable damage between Ken and Deirdre. It could have split them up again. Sorry. You're always sorry! You have affairs, you go behind my back, you criticise me, you mock me, you draw back from me, and all the time you're sorry! Well, I'm sorry, Deirdre, but this time that's not enough! 
uh, very dramatic and uh, Bill had great fun turning the table over. We were quite hoping that he would break it completely because it squeaked for years and we'd be able to have a new table but he didn't succeed in doing that. We got the same table back but we had to have new crockery which was quite good if you needed a new tea set. But I think Ken began to realise that Tracy was something, something else. And she wanted something else. After her mother's boyfriend, next stop, grandmother's boyfriend. Wally Bannister, played by cuddly TV legend and voice of the Wombles, Bernard Cribbins. This was another opportunity that was just too good to miss. We set up um, a boyfriend for Blanche, uh, Wally Bannister, lovely, and we're delighted when Bernard Cribbins agreed to play the character and did it wonderfully. Um, but we thought, you know, look, if Tracy's capable of sleeping with the same guy that her mother slept with, why not go one stage? You know, let's show how, how kind of shameless this young woman can be. And, and frankly, you know, she did it purely for money. The whole attraction with Wally was the fact that she thought that he was loaded and she would, she would have been with him. She would just to get the house in the swimming pool and because then she'd feel like she was somebody. Blanche's boyfriend, of all things, you know, at that age, because she believed he was a millionaire, she slept with him. I mean, there's a word for that, isn't there? Well, I'll say this for you, Wally. You've certainly got away with the ladies. I'm surprised you didn't try it on with me as well. You could have had the set. Look, I know you're going to think badly of me, dearie, but it's not how it looks. Well, I'm sorry. Which bit have I got wrong? You being a randy old beggar who's old enough to be a granddad, or you being a gold-digging little tart. When he suggested that maybe there'd be a little space in his will for her, she just went for it. Shameless. Grasping shameless. Wonderful. But I like Wally, and he likes me. God, just look at her. No shame, no remorse, you brazen little hussy. Yeah? Well, if I'm one, ma'am, it must be in the jeans. She can... <laughs> Tracy's hopes were sunk. Not only did Wally turn out to be a fraud, she got a good soaking into the bargain. It, I was quite nervous. I mean, it was such a small stunt to just throw myself in the pool. But I actually had to throw myself in head first and I had to look like I slipped. And I remember my heart was beating. I thought, what, what am I nervous about? You know, it's, it's nothing. I said, I don't mind going in, I don't mind getting wet, but I just don't want to do the falling. I'm really scared, I'm getting scared about it. So they got a stunt double, and she was brilliant, and you couldn't tell it wasn't me. One little-known fact is that the splash was actually meant for Maggie Jones, who plays Tracy's grandmother, Blanche. Maggie Jones fell ill halfway through the filming of that story and she had to go away for a few months. So at very short notice, um, Blanche's lines were changed to Deirdre. Deirdre was never meant to go in that swimming pool. It was meant to be Blanche. That would have been fantastic. Meanwhile, our man-eater decided she fancied a nibble a little closer to home. Room for a little one. But yeah. why Steve MacDonald? Great in bed. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Right. Right to what? Home, I think. Video and a takeaway. Yeah, it's a bit quiet in here, isn't it? Tracy has always had a thing for Steve. So when you say takeaway, what exactly do you have in mind? She genuinely really fancies him. Sweet and sour, smooth and creamy or hot and spicy. <laughs> Steve did what he did because his wife had run away with his mate and as far as he was concerned, that was it. She'd gone, he's never going to see her again. He was absolutely pie-eyed from a few night, a night in the Rovers. And uh, Tracy came on to him, so he, he drowned his sorrows and other bits with, with Tracy. When his wife left and he thought that she'd run off with Joe, it was one of those things you kind of look around the street and go, who am I most comfortable with? And, of course, he'd never thought in a million years that this had happened to him and that she'd turn absolutely nutty. Trace. Look, don't be shy, Steve. Come on, look, you're hungry. I'm hungry. What's the matter with that? You are hungry, aren't you, Steve? I'm starving. Right then. So why did the girl next door turn into the bitch queen from hell? You've got to have some sense of where all this spite and venom's coming from. You know, she's not evil. You know, she's the spawn of Deirdre, who's a wonderful woman, you know, so there's, there's something more going on, isn't there? I, they, they, I mean, I blame the parents. I always blame the parents. I think Tracy possibly gets quite a lot of personality from Deirdre, but I think she's also very much Ray Langton's daughter. Ray was not an easy bloke. 
he was a bit of a Jack the Lad, you know, and um, I think Tracy's inherited a lot of his maybe devil may care attitude to life. She got it from Ray Langton, definitely. It's all Ray Langton's genes, there's no doubt about that. Some of the blame has to fall at uh, Deirdre and, and Ken's door. I mean, let's face it, they've had a very, very dysfunctional family set up for many years. All their affairs, all their rows, all their splitting up, all the kind of emotional wrangles that they've been involved with. It's actually no wonder that Tracy's grown up a little bit bad. And when you think that the other child who's been significantly involved in the programme during 2003, Peter Barlow, is also a bit of a bad lad, you kind of think maybe there's a common factor in Ken and Deirdre here, just maybe. Yeah, Ken and Deirdre have got previous. I mean, as role models, they are really horrendous. Champagne? What's that in Airdolf? Well, it's a sort of celebration, you know, uh, end of an era. Oh, beginning of a new one. <laughs> Sorry, the, the bottle's empty, love, but here, have my glass. No, thanks. I don't think it's out to celebrate. A divorce? Well, how do you think I feel coming from a broken home? I don't think that's very clever. Tracy? You've got to stop blaming the parents for everything. It's not the parents' fault that one of them turned out to be a bigamist and the other one's dead and now this is the adopted daughter who's, you know, just the devil. Yeah, OK, Deirdre was. She was a bit of a slag, let's face it. And Ken too. But it's not all their fault. Tracy's got to take some of the responsibility. The, the real key for the way Tracy is now is um, New Year's 1990. Ken and Deirdre were separated and her mother had gone off to Paris for New Year and Ken was looking after Tracy. Um, but he didn't know she'd got, um, Deirdre had gone to Paris. And so he's like sort of sitting down sort of New Year's Eve trying to sort of have a nice time with Tracy and then Tracy just mentions the fact that her mother's gone swanning off with this boyfriend. And Ken just erupts. Did you know about this? Yeah. And you didn't tell me? I'm not a spy, Dad. Oh, so you don't mind your mother going off to Paris for a dirty weekend with some spiv, don't you? You don't see anything wrong with your mother getting in and out of bed with every man who knocks on the front door? Dad? Do you know what I've given up for that woman? I mean, do you really think I like living in this rat hole over a shop in the street that I was born in? It's a humiliation! And he says to her, you know, I didn't want to spend New Year with you. I want to be with, with, with Deirdre. Don't talk like this, please. Well, why not? It's true! You know it's true! But I'm here, I'm with it's you. It's not you I want, it's Deirdre! I don't... He follows her and he says, look, I'm really, really sorry, and she just flares at him. Tracy, I'm your father. No, you're not. You're not my real father, so why don't you do us all a favour? Leave us alone, leave us both alone, for good. It was fantastic. It was dawn accident at best. It was absolutely brilliant. And that, to me, is the key to, to the Tracy that you see now. Wipe the wine rods, please. I think what the problem with Tracy Barlow, or what makes Tracy Barlow like she is, is that she'll do a scene and people will feel sorry for her and they'll think, oh, you know, she's all right, really. And then five minutes later, she's doing something absolutely awful again. So I think people just never know where they are with her. Certainly no one was prepared for what Tracy did next. Coming up, the bet to end all bets. You and him in bed together alone. I bet you can't do it. You're on. And the story that was made in soap heaven. The bitch, the geek and the transsexual. Roy sleeps with Tracy Bible and she has his baby so it's like does that happen? What's this? See what we've got to do here. It is a ridiculous and totally impossible plot. Coming up, Typhoon Tracy wreaks havoc across Weatherfield and the street's odd couple are caught in the eye of the storm. It's one of the greatest soap stories ever. Wonderful on screen, ludicrous on paper. It is a ridiculous and totally impossible plot. Roy sleeps with Tracy Barlow and she has his baby, so it's like, how does that happen? I didn't realise that Roy was going to marry Tracy. <laughs> what what planet could that actually occur? Are the script writers on drugs or something? Where on earth did they dream up this one? The story had everyone talking. Racy Tracy used a drug to bed nerdy Roy for a one-penny bet. When she found out she was pregnant, she let him believe he was the dad. 
Then she sold the unborn baby to Roy and his transsexual partner, Haley. Only trouble is, Roy wasn't the dad. That little bombshell would be dropped on another unsuspecting man in the street. The whole Cropper story was pitched by a writer at conference. Um, and on paper, you think, don't like this. Don't like different... Don't like it, but sort of like it as well, because it involves lots of people. I read a few paragraphs and I couldn't quite work out what it was I was reading. I couldn't gauge the tone. It, it was clearly extraordinary, but I, I, I couldn't tell whether it was, you know, madly comic, blackly comic, deeply tragic. And as I read on, I suddenly realised it was all of those things. I heard about the storyline before, long before I read about it. Um, David Nielsen, who plays Roy, told me, because he'd been talking, as he does, with the, the writers to find out what's coming up, and, uh, and I didn't believe him. As actors, we have tremendous admiration for the writers and the way they do it. Often you hear of a story like that one, and you think, this is not going to work. I mean, how can you make it work? It's such a great story because it starts with the most unlikely premise that, you know, beautiful, much sought after Tracy Barlow is actually going to bed Roy Cropper. And you've got to kind of buy into that at the start. I was called into Kieran, uh, Kieran Roberts' office and he told me the storyline and I was just like that. What? Really? <laughs> Now, we had lots of debates around the, the conference table with the writers, you know, some writers feeling uneasy about the tone of it and where it was taking us. And, and every time we felt we just had to, to, to pursue it, had to be bold, had to be brave. I just couldn't make the leap. I just couldn't see at that point how we would go from where we were with her to, to where we are now. But of course, as it always is in current history, it's pretty seamless. After her failed attempts to win the hearts of Dev and Steve, Tracy was determined to prove she could have any man she wanted, even oddball Roy Cropper. It was place your bets time. If I couldn't get Roy Cropper into bed, I'd give it up now, I'd join an honorary. All right, put your money where your mouth is. Just get him into bed, mind, not actually do out. You and him in bed together alone. I bet you can't do it. You're on. How much? A penny. A penny? Yeah, well, I wouldn't be doing it for the money, would I? What would that make me? So why do The croppers are so well loved and the nation has completely taken them into their hearts that to have Tracy as the viper in the nest stirring it all up was just fantastic. I think it's a, a story that hasn't been done before. So I think it's always exciting to try something new, but I think there was that moment that, you know, at first where we where I certainly was quite nervous about it. You know, kind of, I've shot these scenes, so I'll just hold my breath and see how they go down. It's great for me, because I've been, you know, uh, over the last couple of years frying a lot of sausages and standing behind the counter. And to just have some other um, area to, to explore. I just remember walking um, into town with David Nielsen and he said to me, I'm really sorry. <laughs> so what are you sorry for? He said, well, you're just going to get so much hassle this summer. Well, for the Roy Cropper to go to bed with this beautiful young woman, it's like... I can handle that, you know, I can handle walking down the street and people saying, oh, me, <laughs> Tracy Barlow. But she's got to do the same thing and she's been to bed with the Roy Cropper. She's, um, you know, that's, that's more difficult to bear. I would imagine. Not for my wife, of course. In another bold move, the writing team had Tracy using a date rape technique to get Roy into bed. As usual, they didn't shy away from controversy. Going into the area of date rape, was obviously tricky and, and, and we thought very carefully about it. We had to make it believable that Tracy could get Roy into bed um, and for him not to remember sufficiently what had happened. I have to say, I was one of the people who were very, very against date rape in, in that situation. Um, there were some people that are saying, yeah, but it's not, it's not a date rape because she doesn't shag him. Are you, are you coming to bed with me? Of course I am. Let's just get your clothes off first, eh? But no one's going to believe that after a couple of vodkas, a teetotaler doesn't know that he's gone to bed with a woman. You just... No, no one believed that. This wasn't going to happen. So there had to be something else. For the story to work, there had to be another element. That element was the date rape. Obviously, it did open us up to accusations that we were in some way making light of the whole issue of date rape. But, of course, it wasn't a date rape. You know, we, we actually had to kind of stand firm at that point because people did criticise us for a few weeks. I absolutely hated it. I thought it was, you know, this is Coronation Street. What, what are we doing having a date rape storyline in here? You know, this is a fairly disgusting thing to do. Um, but one of the things the producer said to us is, look, just trust us. This works out. It will be brilliant. You will love it. And then as the story unfolds, it's like, oh, my God, where's it get? 
there's a pregnancy, she's blaming him, and it was just incredible the way it worked out. It was like, this is fantastic, because, of course, we all love stuff like that, because we're, we're forever, you know, making up our own storylines anyway, because there's nothing else to do when you sat around for hours. So, uh, you know, Roy sleeping with Tracy Barlow was just a cracker. You do, you sit in the green room and you find yourself talking about it like it's real life. So you go, oh, so so what does Hayley do then? All oh, right, and so Julie will go into that and then they go, but what about Karen? So Karen does what, does she? Oh, I can't believe, maybe she'll do this. And we all find ourselves kind of finishing stories off. And... It was quite brilliant, quite brilliant the way it was done. And um, again, the humour leading to the pathos, leading to the tragedy uh, is superb. All the risks paid off, and the morning after the night before scene has gone down in street history as an all-time classic. I mean, if you take that initial moment where Roy Cropper wakes up in bed with Tracy at number one, that is magic. Stand by. Action. You think, well, all you can do, actually, is screw this up, because it's there on the page. You know, some scenes you get where you can actually add something or, you know, you can make something work. Well, this was this is one of those things where you think, you just got to do it. I just remember that day was great because I didn't have to do anything. I just lay there in the bed all day. She's um, draped his clothes around the room. So when he wakes up, his wife fronts are draped over um, a standard lamp. And the ones they had were just too too trendy. See, white ones would look like from... I think white ones might look better. The night do, yeah, because, because, because he's... Yeah. Trendy I think out. it's like a bit too trendy, a bit retro. <laughs> They've got to be white wife fronts, or maybe off-white, probably off-white, but the ones they got were, were sort of patterned and a bit, a bit sort of... a bit too 21st century for Roy. Stand by to do this then, please. One of my favourite all-time Coronation Street moments is, is Roy Cropper waking up in Tracy Barlow's bed, wondering what on earth he's done, what on earth has happened, and then having to sneak downstairs, realising he's in the Barlow's, and trying to get out the door while they're all having breakfast. We're all sitting around pouring tea, and who should creep down the stairs, shoes in hand, but Roy Cropper. And we say, well, I'd like a cup of tea, Roy. Cup of tea? Uh, no, the no, cup of tea line was fantastic. Because that's just Bye. British, that's just what we do in England. It's like, a cup of tea solves everything. Oh, um, it's double locked. Yeah, I'll get the key. It won't take a minute. And then, of course, Tracy comes downstairs, that wonderful entrance down the stairs, you know, um, absolutely relishing every moment of it. Is Tracy upstairs? Uh, I, I, th I think she is, yes. You think she is? Were you really going to sneak off without saying goodbye, you naughty boy? I'm so sorry, I di didn't want to disturb you. And I thought you were a gentleman, Roy Cropper. He actually goes the, the wrong way when he sees her, you know, and then he, has to go, he actually has, has to approach her slightly to get round the door, cos Ken's there. I'm sorry, I've got to go. Go goodbye. What the hell's going on, Tracy? It's just... it's, uh, It was great. From then on, Tracy spiralled out of control. She was thrown out by Ken and Deirdre, then found out she was pregnant. Roy was mortified and tried to commit suicide, only to be saved by Haley. A bizarre haggling process began as Tracy agreed to sell her unborn baby to the childless couple. Roy even paid to marry Tracy, believing it would guarantee his paternal rights. As the sorry saga unfolded, the whole street seemed to be having a go at the Weatherfield Witch. She just ruined Roy's life. She's conned that couple out of every penny they've got. She tried to, you know, practically brought his marriage to an end to Haley. She's um, making, convincing him that it's his child. Getting money from them, playing with their emotions when they're simple people, but sincere and genuine people. And the way she violated their feelings, I think, was the worst thing she did. Not, not content merely to, to damage the reputation of a very decent man and damage the relationship of a very decent couple. She was actually prepared to take them for a ride financially as well. So I think that's all pretty despicable. She nearly killed him. He nearly killed himself through grief and what she'd done to him, and she just didn't care. She just wanted the money. 
on the case of, yes, Cropper versus Barlow, I have to say, uh, she's guilty as sin. She goes down, definitely. There's no redeeming factor in her character or in her behaviour after what she did to the Cropper clan, without a doubt. No doubt at all that the street writers made Terrible Tracy public enemy number one. But in the green room, everyone loves the woman who has turned her into a grade-A super bitch. As an actor, it can be very enjoyable being horrible. It's just playing mediocre things isn't good, and playing very nice things can be very unrewarding. Um, the most rewarding thing is either being very funny or very horrible. And Kate's very good at, at making Tracy horrible. <laughs> Oh, Kate's fantastic. She's uh, she's a very she's a million miles away from uh, f from Tracy. Uh, very sweet girl. Very nice. Very intelligent. Kate is absolutely fantastic. I mean, she swans in like the beautiful little minx she is. She's just absolutely fantastic, and I've really enjoyed working with her. And I know David has as well. She's very very funny. The look she gives Roy. Um, Sometimes they don't nearly corpse me. You remember waking up with me, don't you? I do, yes. She makes me laugh. She really makes me laugh. Well, she's funny, you see. She's 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 a character actress. I think Kate. You know, she plays. It's a good character, and she just plays it so fantastically because it's just like an arch of the eyebrow or you know a twinkle of the eye, and she just can get something across in a heartbeat. I think she's a delicious character for writers to write for her because she is so wicked and you can have her sort of hanging around in corners like scheming. It's a lot of fun writing Tracy, it, giving her the lines and I love the sulky look that Kate Ford's got because that is just perfect because th this this girl you know feels like the world owes her a phaser and goes around with a slap look on her face the whole time. I think she really wants Tracy to be a whole person and, and wherever she can she'll like layer it with a little bit of softness and a little bit of vulnerability. Just a little flicker of something hurt that you just see go between her eyes before she launches into her next tirade against, you know, the good people of Weatherfield. It's just so lovely to, to wake up in the morning and know you've got these great scenes to film. And I couldn't have been luckier with, with Tracy Barlow because I've had everything. You know, I've had comedy, tragedy, the whole lot, you know, and it's just been fantastic. The truth is, Harold, your loving husband couldn't wait to get his hands on a real woman. <sighs> you are evil. Truth hurts, doesn't it? I mean, you can have as many operations as you want, wear a dress, go to the ladies, but it doesn't make you a real woman, does it? You'll never be able to give Roy what he wants, what he really wants in bed. You've nothing that I want. Hayley's right, you're a monster. Well, you weren't saying that that night. You weren't saying that when you were ripping my clothes off. Stop it. You weren't saying that when you were getting me into bed. I am not listening to any more of your lies. You weren't saying that when you were making me pregnant. So convincing was Kate Ford's portrayal of the Corrie cow that some viewers couldn't differentiate between the two women. The reaction from the public's been really funny. People just desperate to tell me all the time when I first came out. It weren't his fault, Hayley. It weren't his fault. It was that little bitch. <laughs> so she lured him. <laughs> I was quite worried about it because people always warn you that, you know, people take it really seriously and... But people that come up, they, they do, they say, ooh, you better leave Roy Cropper alone. Probably everywhere I went, they were just like, give that Tracy a smacking gob when you see her next. And you'd be like, OK. <laughs> people are very, very angry at her. And, you know, I'm constantly having to defend Kate and say, oh, she's completely different from a character. You know, you mustn't think that because I'm, I'm sure poor Kate must be getting stick everywhere she goes. I think people really enter into the spirit of it and they like the baddie. So they, you know, it's, only, it's a bit of fun. I've not had anyone take it too seriously, thank goodness. Even though we all enjoyed Tracy in full-on bitch mode, it was time for the character to develop an extra dimension. I talked to Kate Ford about, you know, how to get some depth to this and how to uh, find some kind of empathy with, with a character who on the surface is pretty, pretty bad. You, you're constantly looking at ways to try to explain her behaviour. Um, whether it's her upbringing, whether it's her looking for love, whether it's um, sort of a deep sort of rooted vulnerability. Um, 
You have to explore these things and occasionally you have to voice them. This is a, a, a slightly messed up young woman who, who deep down is looking for something, um, and I'd call it love, it, it's not as simple as that, but she's looking for something meaningful in her life. She's looking for a real relationship. I think Tracy needs to have that side to her where you see that actually she is capable of some sort of emotion, otherwise people aren't going to buy it much longer. Coming up, confessions of a super bitch. Steve saying, well, you've got to tell him, you can't do that to the real father. You know, you may be surprised, he may turn around and say, OK, let's give it a go, or whatever. And then, of course, she goes, right, I will do. Right, it's yours. It's your baby. What? And Mission Impossible, creating sympathy for the devil. I feel great sympathy for the character. In spite of the terrible things she's done before, I really feel for her. She's, she needs help. <laughs> Coming up, you knew it would end in tears. Tracy starts to pay for her sins. And is this the moment when Steve McDonald found a way into the hardest heart in Weatherfield? After the chaos caused by Typhoon Tracy, the street writers gave us another delicious twist in the tale. Tracy hadn't had sex with Roy at all. The baby was the result of her one night stand with Steve and in true soap fashion, she dropped the bombshell on Christmas day. Christmas Day in Coronation Street, something always goes wrong. We can't just sit there quietly eating our turkey, can we? And it's usually one of the Barlows. It's not Roy's baby. What? It's not Roy's. Flipping heck, does Roy know? Clearly, lousy at maths, never looked at the size of this bump, never figured out the dates of the one night stand. It never occurred to him for one second that it could be his. She's telling Steve initially that, um Roy's not the father and it's somebody else, but I don't know where to tell him. And, of course, Steve's saying, well, you've got to tell him. You can't do that to the real father. You know, you may be surprised. He may turn around and say, OK, let's give it a go, or whatever. And then, of course, she goes, right, I will do. Right, it's yours. What? Right, so you think that I should tell him? Absolutely. No, you're right, yeah, thanks. It was my pleasure. It's your baby. What? The baby's yours. So it's like, you know, how am I going to play this? Is it, is it going to be completely over the top of like, what? Dun, dun, dun. So uh, I thought just the, uh, the good old classic Coronation Street stare might, uh, <laughs> might do for this scene. So, so she was just hoping that he would, once he knew she was having the, his baby, he would drop everything and go and live with her at number seven in the, with the baby. And she actually says, you know, you've got everything here, me, the baby, and number seven, what more could you want? While the news may have come as a total shock to Steve and to millions of Corrie viewers, it had all been part of a very cunning plan. <laughs> we knew from the very beginning this would be Steve's baby. Um, it was plotted out very, very carefully um, to get maximum impact out of all the stories um, and all the characters that would interweave. But we sort of threw it away because, on purpose, we didn't want all the viewers to think, from the start, oh, it's Steve's baby. It turns out that Wicked Tracy had actually fallen head over heels for her old street mate. The seeds of love may well have been planted a long time ago at Weatherfield Comprehensive. Wait, I'll leave alone and at your age, mate. All right. What'd you do that for? Why don't you pick on someone your own size? Yeah, it was only a joke. Now, if that's not young love, I'm Albert Tatlock. At school together, as teenagers, um, she had a bit of a crush on him, and she's gone away, and she's come back, and she's still got a bit of a crush on him. You know, she did quite like Steve uh, when, when she was a kid. She had, she had a crush on him, and that's developed into this psychotic story. Now. Steve, what sort of woman do you think I am? Oh, I don't know. Come on, Steve, can't you see? It's the new vulnerable Tracy. I think we've worked very hard to kind of soften the character because we've tried to get under her skin. You know, some of those scenes where Tracy's pouring her heart out to Steve, I think are, are absolutely, you know, heartrending. And at that point, you know, in spite of the terrible things she's done before, I really feel for her. Let me make this crystal clear. I don't want anything to do with this baby. I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear about it. As far as I'm concerned, it's got nothing to do with me. OK. 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 Steve starts shouting at Tracy and 
so you forget that Tracy's as nasty as she is. Because, you know, you see a vulnerable side. For me, maybe I'm, maybe I'm weird. I do see the character as having great... I, I feel great sympathy for the character. So I don't see her even as a super bitch. I mean, she is a monstrous, absolutely monstrous, the things she's done. But I think... I think you can see, sort of, you know, that, that she's, she needs help. But finding sympathy for Tracy was always going to be as hard as oh, finding... There you go class in Les Battersby. I don't think she does deserve sympathy. Kate's under the impression that, that she deserves sympathy. And uh, when she airs this view on, on, uh, on set, the whole crew go like that. No, she's a cow. I'm forever defending Tracy Barlow. I go, no, she's not, she's not. She's, you know what, she's really nice, really. This just, and people go, no, she's not. And I, go, oh, and I get really passionate about it. You see her cry and you sort of want to think, well, there's a woman crying who's pregnant with a child or who's just lost her baby. And you do want to feel sympathy, but then you just look and you go, no, it's Tracy Barlow crying. I mean, she deserves everything she gets thrown at her. And she's something, she's going to have to do something pretty spectacular to make anyone actually like her. With the baby imminent, Tracy is in knots. Thanks to her grandmother, she's now got her own home in the street, but what she really wants is Steve. Time's running out because Steve's about to marry Karen. The two women are an accident waiting to happen. I'm really looking forward to, to, to the Karen and Tracy relationship. They both like an argument. They both like to be a bit devious. The difference is Karen's mischievous devious and lovable, but Tracy's kind of, like, cruel and, you know, she's really got that dark side to her. They can't stand each other. <laughs> <laughs> people are desperate for Karen and Tracy to have a big scrap. That's one thing people always tell me when they see me in the street. When are you gonna, when's pa uh, Karen gonna punish Tracy? You know. Two, two, two very hard women, you know, doing battle across the street. I think it'd be great. Finally, baby Barlow arrives. As one sensational chapter draws to a close, another one's just beginning. One thing is for certain: we haven't heard the last of Tracy Barlow. She's just boiling with anger about it because she knows that it's all not what it is and she can't keep a secret. At least she's honest in, in a weird way. At least she's honest. What you see is what you get with Tracy Barlow. As the story reaches its, its real climaxes, the, the really, really big events as Steve and Karen and Tracy and the Croppers and the Barlows all kind of collide in a wonderful, uh, you know, soap display of pyrotechnics, that, you know, people are going to love this. It, it's just, I think this story is going to go down in the history of Coronation Street as one of the great stories. Mm -hmm.